morning. Here's one thing I want to promise you. You are going to have that song in your head all week long when you drive somewhere. You're going to be driving all week long. I've had that in my head. I've just been driving. I'm killing it. I'm killing it. Anyway, which is actually the opposite of what we want you to get from this series, so that's funny. Uh, today, I just want to welcome everybody. Before we get to the content, real quick, I just wanted to reiterate what Keith said Saturday Night Church is our biggest opportunity as a church that we've had in a long time uh, to reach people that don't normally go to church. And I just want to take this opportunity uh, to just, just again, reinforce those cards that we gave you. That's more than just a, hey, give somebody a card. I just want to reinforce that and go, most people who don't go to church would love to go to church on Saturday night, but they also think that maybe that's like the weirdo service or something. Like, what, is somebody going to, like, make me eat Spanish meatballs or something like that? So I just want to encourage you to really use this service as an opportunity. You're already coming. Take those cards. Those cards represent five people. Uh, invite them and uh, invite them to church and bring them here on Saturday night. Now, to the content of killing it. This is week two. As we get into week two, I just want to kind of catch us up because last week, We talked about how pride kills almost every part of our life. It's hurting our relationships. It's hurting us. We watch it happen. Just this past week, I was thinking about how many times in my life pride has affected me. I know when I was was in college, I wasn't, um, especially when I was a freshman, I wasn't like the best student. (laughs) That's an understatement. I wasn't the best student, and my parents kind of wondered, like, hey, your grades don't look good. So they kind of picked me up one day, and they were going to take me out to eat, and they were going to talk about my grades, right? So I remember my mom turning to me, and she was like, you know, if you would just make a list every day of all the things that you need to do, and then when you get something done, you should just scratch it off the list. Like, doesn't that sound great? And I'm sitting there going, Mom, just, you know, in my head, I was, I was like, shut up. You know, like, what are you even talking about, woman? And they gave me a whole bunch of other ideas about things that I could do and things I could do to make more responsible. And <clears throat> Well, now I'm 38, and I, I have this little book that I carry. It's just a little notebook. And every day I write down in this book everything that I've got to do for the day, And then when I do something, I just scratch it off the list. And I wish, and how many times do you wish you could do that? Where you could go back in time 20 years ago and you could just like go and just, hey, hey, McFly, she's she's trying to tell you something that's real simple right here. Just, Just do it, you moron. But what keeps us from doing it? It's our pride. It's because we don't want to hear that, and we don't want to hear it from our mom, or we don't want to hear it from our boss, or we don't want to hear it from that annoying person, right? But, but it's right, and our pride keeps us from listening. And probably the number one effect that pride has had on us is it's kept us from seeing wisdom. That's just right in front of us for the taking. But because we've got all this pride inside of us, we're not going to listen to it. And every aspect of our life has suffered because of it. So last week we asked these three questions. This is how we wrapped up the series, or a sermon last week. Here it was, how does pride manifest itself in your life? We had the ultimate exercise. You were supposed to go and talk to somebody and be like, hey, how do you see pride manifesting itself in, in my life? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands of how many people did that. But I'm going to guess almost everybody thought it was a great idea. But just as a little stinger, but your pride kept you from actually doing it. That's my guess. Anyway, number two, how does pride masquerade? (laughs) Right? So so pride doesn't just come out and be like, hey, I'm pride and everything. It kind of hides. And so how is it it hiding? How is it masked in your life? And then finally, just how long are you going to follow it? See, this whole series, it's only a couple weeks. And then we're going to move on to some other ridiculous series, right? And we're not going to talk about pride, and we're not going to talk about humility. And this, this is your moment. This is your opportunity. If you, if you don't find pride and, and humility, and if you don't find humility and get rid of pride and kill pride in your life, you're never going to. Don't pass up this opportunity to do away with pride and find humility. Now, 
Here's what we're going to talk about today. We're actually going to define humility. Now this week, this week is actually probably harder to hear than last week. <clears throat> because, I'm <clears throat> sorry, I got popcorn stuck in my pipe. <laughs> Shouldn't pound that, right? So, I don't know, no problem. Anyway, now it's all, it's all good, so everybody don't worry. No, man, there's a lot of people like, get him water, staff. Uh, anyway, so this week is going to be harder to hear than last week was because last week there's so many of you that like we're at this point where you admitted that you had a pride problem. Right? There's so many people last week that we just went around and we were just like, I knew a water bottle was coming. That's great. Last week was good. I'm just going to go ahead and drink it. Oh, doesn't that? Mm, you got to try water. Anyway, so last week um, we talked about pride. And, and here's the thing. It's not hard to admit you've got a pride problem because it's not like other sins, like sexual sin, that's kind of hard to admit you have a problem, right? Or if you're a liar, like it's kind of hard to admit that, like nobody wants to admit that. But pride, on the other hand, it's kind of like, well, I'm basically, you know, I, I mean, I'm out there, I'm killing it, I'm the envy of people, and I've got a little bit of a pride problem, right? That's not hard to admit. The hard part is to go and take that first step, that first act of actually humbling yourself before that person or before that coworker or even before God and taking that act of humility, that's where things get really, really difficult because everybody wants to be humble and nobody wants to see pride continue to destroy their life. But do we, are we a- actually able to take that first step of humility? So today's going to be harder than last week. And I hope you hang in there for the ride. We're going to talk about and define humility, like what it is that you would be able to identify in every circumstance in your life. You'd be able to go, okay, that's pride. Hands down, that's pride. And this is humility. So, first thing that humility is, is humility is an honest evaluation of yourself. It's honestly evaluating who you are. Because God... God doesn't want you to humiliate yourself. God doesn't want you to say that you're less than you are. He doesn't want you to just walk around and be like, I'm a worm, I'm dirt, I'm nothing, I'm insecure. God doesn't want you to do that. God just wants you to know who you are. But the problem is we have a really hard time evaluating ourselves. Now this comes from Romans chapter 13, or 12, sorry. Romans chapter 12, Paul says this. For by the grace given to me... In other words, he's saying, hey, I'm just passing this on to you because God has given me the grace to be able to pass this on to you. So this this was passed on to me, and I want to pass it on to you. For the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself. Hold on for just a second. Think about that for you. Think of yourself. Paul is referring to that time when you're driving down the road and you begin to think of yourself. Now, this is kind of weird that we do this, but we're a little schizophrenic. We do that, though. We drive down the road, and, you know, like, we'll go over to your brother's house, and your brother's got just, seems like he's got the perfect house. And you get in your car with your family, or you just get in your car, and you drive away, and and you're thinking about how perfect his house is, and there's a little bit of jealousy, and so you start to think on yourself. And you're like, yeah, but, but at least I'm not a jerk. Right? And we begin to think on our, yeah, he's got the perfect house, but at least I'm not a moron, right? And we begin to think on ourselves. And what that is, is we begin to evaluate ourselves. Or we go over to our sister's house, we go over to our parents' house, we go, we're driving home from work, and we think about how everybody's got that thing going on in their life, and we go and we begin to think on ourselves. Paul's drawing attention to that time in the car or in the shower or right before you go to bed when you are thinking on yourself. And I would argue that when you think about yourself, that is probably the most important moment of your day and you're not even aware that it's happening. It's the most important thing about who you are because then you come up with who you think you are based on what you think on when you think of yourself. And Paul's saying, hey, when you think about yourself, do this for me. When you do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather, again, he says it, when you think of yourself, think of yourself with 
sober judgment. I think that's the perfect word, right? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I'm, I'm guessing by what I'm looking at in the room. There's some people in here done some drinking, okay? <laughs> and those of you who have done some drinking, how tall are you when you're drunk? You are 10 feet tall and bulletproof, right? Because you're not in a good place to evaluate yourself. I was at a party one time. <laughs> Those are the best stories, right? I was at a party one time. I was at a party one time, and it, we always had parties in Nebraska. You just have them by the river because there's nowhere else to go. So we go to the river, and uh, somebody said, you ought to jump off the bridge. So I was like, okay. So I got up on this bridge. It's a pretty, pretty high bridge. And I got ready to jump into the water. <laughs> now, that's funny because the deepest river in my part of the country, northwest Nebraska, is the Niobrara River. At its deepest spots, it's probably two feet deep. Okay, it's just sand and water. I'm not at the deepest spot. I'm at like the foot spot. It's wide, but it's just like a foot. And I'm up on the bridge and I'm like, <laughs> this is going to be great. And I jump off because why? Because I'm not thinking with sober judgment. I'm not looking at situation. I'm not very good at evaluating the situation. I jump off and stick in the sand, right? And it's just kind of kind of like in a hole, my legs were up, and anyway, I fall in there, and everybody just watches me, and they're laughing, and I just sort of fall back as the water begins to trickle over my face, and I probably would have drowned there, right, if I was just a little bit more, if I had one more beer. We don't evaluate things very well. Now I lived, right? <laughs> I lived, and everything was fine, and I walked like, kind of like, walked like this for a couple weeks, because I landed right on my butt, but anyway... You don't evaluate things good when you're drunk. And Paul says, I think it's the perfect word, he says, when you think of yourself, think of yourself with sober judgment. When we think of ourselves, a lot of times we're off on la-la land. We're just, sometimes we convince ourselves that we are incredible people when we're not. And this is easy to spot in other people, right? When, when somebody thinks of themselves more than they should, it's easy to spot, Right? It's that person whose world is crumbling around them who's walking around giving advice to everybody, right? You know that person. If you don't know that person, you are that person. You know that person. Their world is falling apart at every seam, and they're going around saying, I know what you should do. And we're able to see, we're able to see people that don't see themselves with sober judgment easily, but can we see it? In ourselves. Paul says, think of yourself with sober judgment. Well, how do we do that since we're terrible at evaluating ourselves? He says, in accordance with the faith, God has, here's the word, distributed to each of you. So when you think of yourself, if you're just left on your own and you're going to evaluate yourself, you are going to be terrible at it. Your evaluation process is going to be like a drunk person. But if you want to have a sober opinion of yourself, then this is how you need to view it. You need to view it in accordance with the faith that God has, and here's the word, distributed to you. Here's how I think you need to think of yourself. This is a little box that really expensive rings come in, right? When my uh, wife, uh, when I asked her to marry me, I... <laughs> Took her out to a gazebo, and I had a dozen roses. I had a guy out in the woods playing music. I nailed it. <laughs> Some of you schmucks didn't know that this was going to haunt you for the rest of your life, right? How'd, you, how, how'd he ask you to marry you? Well, we were in a car in the Walmart parking lot. He was like, you want to get married? <laughs> Misty. Anyway, I nailed it. I'm so glad I did. It had nothing to do with what I was going to say. But anyway, one of my... When my wife got, she got the wedding ring and I showed it to her. And do you know what everybody asked about? Everybody was like, man, that's a really great ring. What did the box look like? No, nobody asked that. Nobody cares what the box looked like. This is a box. And this is who you are. And if you want to know who you are, you're just a person that contains what God distributes to you. And God may put incredible faith and incredible gifts and incredible talents in you. He may give you large portions of money. You may be incredible. 
But it's only because God has distributed it in your life and you're just, you're just a box that holds it. And Paul's saying, hey, if you, if you want to be humble, here's what you need to do. If you want to see life soberly, you need to understand you're just a box that contains what God has distributed. And you didn't make it on your own, and you wouldn't have it on your own, and it was only by God's grace that you have anything at all. Man, how would your life change if you viewed yourself as just a container, as just a box that held God's grace and mercy? I can promise you that, as simple as that is, it would change every relationship it would change every conversation. It would change everything about you if when you think about yourself, you thought of yourself as just containing what God had distributed to you. Second thing that humility is, is humility is, is confidence in God. Not in ourselves, but confidence in God. And this is, this is tough because we all wake up in the morning and we want to have a reason to be confident, right? Because if, if we didn't have a reason to be confident, we wouldn't wake up in the morning. We wouldn't go to our jobs. We need, we need something to draw on, something, some reason to be confident. So we're always looking at that. Well, here's Jesus tells a story, and he kind of describes a confidence in ourselves. He says this story. To, he says to, to some who were standing around Jesus, who were confident of their own righteousness, okay, a couple weeks ago, if you were here, we took that big word, righteousness, like, what does that mean? It just means goodness. It's as simple as that. Let's replace that word. It says, to those uh, the confident of their own goodness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. He said this, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. So the Pharisee was a religious leader. I mean, you could very interchangeably change that with pastor or priest in our modern day. It was the godly religious person. And a tax collector, the closest thing I ever can draw on is like a pimp, okay? No, like nobody thought of them well, okay? You've never been like, man, my Uncle Joey, he's great. He's a pimp, right? You don't think that way about a pimp. That's the same way with tax collectors. Tax collectors were just people that were renowned for being thieves and working for the wrong people. So, so there's two guys. Verse 11. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed. I want you to count these as I go along. How many times in his prayer he says, I. How he's standing before God and he's somehow drawing attention to himself. It says, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. That's who he is. He's confident in himself and who he is. And how did he get confident in himself? He did the comparison game. And we all do the comparison game, don't we? When we think of ourselves or we think of other people, we are constantly comparing ourselves with other people. In fact, that's the world we live in. We might as well get out our notebooks and keep tabs, right? We might as well just be keeping tabs on who's got the nicer car and who's got the nicer life and who sounded smarter and who nailed that joke and who's got a bigger fantasy football trophy room. That's for me, I guess. But anyway... There's a, there's just, we just constantly are playing the comparison game, and that's how this guy arrived there, is he looked around and he said, okay, here's how I'm going to feel confident. I'm going to look at other people, and I'm going to feel pretty good about myself. Any of us can play that game. All we got to do is find the right people to compare ourselves to, right? And so who do we automatically compare ourselves to? This, way, this is just the human race. This is what we do. The people we compare ourselves to when I talk to people, right? <laughs> well, I try to be a good person, you know. It's not like I killed anybody. Oh, okay. So that's your standard. I, compared to a murderer, <laughs> I am fantastic. That's what we do. We compare ourselves. This past week, if you want to have some fun, go online, go to our Facebook page, and look at a blog that I wrote just recently about um, uh, Jihad Johnny, right? Jihad John. 
Uh, I just compared him to the Apostle Paul. I said, hey, he killed a bunch of people religiously, and so did the Apostle Paul, and God's grace saved him. And and everybody's like, no, 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 no. (laughs) Don't do that. A lot of people didn't like that because that's our last guy. That's the bottom of the rung right there. That's our last guy that we can possibly compare ourselves to. He cut off people's heads. He cut off Americans' heads on camera. That's the guy that we can compare ourselves to when we can't compare ourselves to anybody else. Because at least we can look at him and go, well, I'm better than him. And that's it. And so the Pharisee is standing and he's like, well, at least I'm not like this tax collector playing the comparison game. Verse 13. But the tax collector stood at a distance, didn't even go all the way up. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, Have mercy on me, a sinner. What if we did that? What if we were just a person when we thought about ourselves, on our knees before God, aware of our sin, aware of all the times we had fallen short, and what if we were just a container to receive God's mercy? What if we begged for it? Have you ever had to have you ever had to beg for God's mercy? I have. Right? We a lot of times we won't even get down on our knees and I I used to think, well, do you have to get on your knees when you pray and blah 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 blah? And then there's times where I just find myself down on my knees begging for God's mercy. And it's in that moment that we really get who we are. And Jesus said, verse 14, I tell you that this man, the tax collector, not who everybody else thinks, not the pastor, the priest, the Pharisee, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God for all those, and catch this, this is deep, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves they will be exalted. And if we just had an understanding of where our confidence needed to be, and i got to tell you, I can't put my confidence in myself because I know that everything that I have, every little, every little gift, any little ability, every little scrap of money, and even the food in my cupboards, that's been, that's been given to me by God. I can't brag about that. I can't boast about that. It's all come from God. And I don't even deserve what he's given. I'm just a container that is on the receiving end of God's mercy. I can tell you, if we viewed ourselves that way, if when we thought about ourselves, that's how we viewed ourselves, it would change our every relationship. It would change our every prayer. It would change our every decision because we would be humble. And you got to understand, God's looking down on the earth and he's going, hey, if you're not humble, I will humble you. And if you are humble, I will exalt you. Now, third, one more. One more definition of humility looks like this. Humility is trusting God with the outcome. Now, I'm going to explain that one a little bit because we're terrible at that. I'm about to read you a passage of Scripture that you don't want me to read. You're familiar with it. Sometimes you've treated it like a bomb, right? Right? It's like this scripture verse, and you're like, well, he can't mean that. And he can't expect me to do that. And if I were to, like, really live that out, like, like that would mean bad stuff for me. So we approach it like a bomb. We're like, maybe if I cut the blue wire, maybe if I cut the yellow wire. I don't know. I mean, I, guess I need to cut one of the wires. I need to diffuse this bomb. And so we look at this scripture this way. But I want to tell you, this, this is humility, And as I read this scripture, the the verse isn't saying, hey, you're, you're going to be humiliated for the rest of your life. What it means is, if you do this, if you act humble in this way, that God is in control of the outcome. That you have completely surrendered that God's the one in control. Because remember, God, God humbles those who exalt themselves, but he exalts those who humble themselves. So if you will act this way, and you're like, shut up and read the verse. If you, will, if you will act the way I'm about to read, what you're really doing is you're trusting in God 
for the outcome. So you ready? Have I whet your appetite enough? Here we go. Matthew chapter 5. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Yeah, we like that one. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them also the the cheek also. Is that not the most humble act anybody can do? And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. That's it. That's the verse. And we look at that and we go, well, Jesus can't really mean that. He can't really expect me to just give away all that stuff. He can't expect me to not take that person to to court. He can't expect me to just let them insult me, to let let people treat me that way. He can't be saying that. That's exactly what he's saying. And I can prove it to you. Because a few years later, they strike him on the head and the cheek. There's these guards that they were mocking him. I don't know if you realize the reason that Jesus had a crown of thorns on his head is because the, gra- the guards were making fun of him. It was a little pastime. It wasn't, even, it wasn't like the high priest turned to him and said, take him over there and make fun of him. It wasn't like that at all. He was just off in the corner, kind of in a waiting area, and the guards took him and they made a crown of thorns and they put it on his head and they slapped the staff down on his head. God's head. And Jesus' response was zip. And they struck him on his right cheek. And they struck him on his left cheek. And they mocked him and they made fun of him and they said, prophesy. And he did nothing. There's only one thing that Jesus was doing in that moment. He was trusting his heavenly father with the outcome. That even though he would be mocked and beaten and crucified, that he was trusting that God humbles the proud and exalts those who humble themselves. And because Jesus humbled himself in that way, it says in Philippians chapter 2, that God exalted him, that he would have the name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus Christ every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Imagine if we trusted God with the outcome. If we didn't sit there and go, I can't do that, I can't do that. They'll never learn that lesson. I can't just let people disrespect me like that. I can't let people insult me. But instead we just go, you know what? I'm going to humble myself and the rest, that's in God's court. I want to give you one verse today to to absorb, to take home, to live by. It's in James chapter 4. It says this, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. If you're just really a container that is holding what God has given you, and you're trusting him with the outcome, you don't really have any control over it anyway. If you try to exalt yourself, it's not really going to work. If you try to find respect for yourself, that isn't going to work either. But if you humble yourself, humble yourself before the Lord, humble yourself before men, and put all of your chips on God, I can promise you, God will lift you up. What if you've lived that way? What if you lived with that mentality? When you thought about yourself and when you talked to other people, it was just you're just a you're just a humble person receiving what God is willing to give you and you're trusting him with the outcome. I can tell you this. It would change every relationship. It would change every decision. It would change your attitude towards scripture. It would change your attitude towards church. It would change your attitude towards God. It would change every last thing about you. And years from now, you would look back and go, man, I am so, so glad that I killed pride. That I demolished it. That I quit letting it destroy me and everyone around me. I am so glad that I killed the pride in my life. Let me pray for you.